Hey, good afternoon. It is Thursday. And I'm doing the second half today of the Westward Expansion Manifest Destiny. And this one is Immigration and Xenophobia. Uh, if you don't know what Xenophobia is, it's basically the fear of outside influences, fear of immigration, things like that. So, let's talk about this real quick. First of all, immigration. Um, a lot of people are surprised to hear this, but between 1776 and 1812, immigration to the U.S. just kind of stops. There's a lot of stuff happening out in the world. Uh, you got the American Revolution that starts 1776, goes until the 1780s. Then you've got the French Revolution starts in 1789. And then you've got Napoleon and all those wars that are happening in Europe. So immigration stops in the United States. But by the time we get to 1815, immigration starts again. Like for example, 1825, it's estimated that there are 11,000 immigrants that come to the United States. 1830, 23,000. 1840, 84,000. And then when we get into the 1840s, a lot more people come. And that's primarily to do with stuff that happens in Europe. Uh, if you want to learn more about that, you can take the World History II class with me, and I, I talk about that. But between 1841 and 1850, during that 10-year period, there are one and a half million immigrants that come to this country and then in the 1850s we get something like three and a half to four million so it's a lot now the big question is where are most of those people going uh, they're actually going to new york city in new york city there could be as many as 40 ships a day uh, coming in and there was no ellis island at the time ellis island has opened up in the 1880s if i remember correctly uh, most of the people they would just get off a ship uh, if they had family already there in New York, they would go and try to find that family. Others try to find a house that first day where they go and look for a job. So um, there's no assistance. It's get off the ship and fend for yourself. There are some of these immigrants who have purchased land ahead of time and they know where they're going, but they're kind of few and far between. The first immigration office isn't set up until 1855. And that's at a place called Castle Garden. Uh, it still exists today. If you go to New York, it's in Brooklyn, and it is a national historic site. And it's separate from Ellis Island. They're not related. Now, who are these immigrants? The biggest group are the Irish. Uh, most of the Irish, they come after 1845. It's because of the potato famine. It is true that the Irish, once upon a time, ate nothing but potatoes. That's not just a stereotype. And when the potato crops failed, millions of people died because of famine. The United States and Canada are both flooded with Irish immigrants. And by 1851, almost half of all foreign-born people in the United States are Irish. So if you have Irish ancestry, there is a very good chance that your family came over here in the 1840s. I know for a fact that my personal family came over here in the 1840s and 1850s. Most of the Irish, they are poor. They live in New England. Uh, they're what would be called a tenant farmer, meaning that they either work the land for somebody else or they borrow money from somebody else. Uh, others work in industry, some build railroads, some work in construction, some work in factories, but more often than not, the Irish are going to be poor. There's also a lot of Germans. Uh, there are some Germans that come over in the 1830s. There's a large number of Germans that come in the 1850s. And a lot of them come because of failed revolutions. Uh, once again, a world history thing. But in 1848, there are revolutions all over Europe. And most of the German revolutions fail. And... If you were somebody who opposed your German king or your German prince and your revolution fails, you got two choices. You either stay in your little German kingdom and take a chance of being killed, or you leave your country and most of them came to the United States. By 1850, there are about 200,000 German-born immigrants in this country. Uh, the new Germans and the old Germans don't get along very well. If you remember when we talked about the American colonies, we talked about Pennsylvania, and there were a lot of Germans in Pennsylvania, there were a lot of Germans in Georgia, 
those older german generations don't get along very well with the newer german generation so there's a lot of issue um, germans they're a little bit better off and they tend to move to the midwest places like chicago and milwaukee are german societies you can even go to wisconsin today and find german spoken you can go to wisconsin today and find complete german villages these germans are typically going to be more educated doctors lawyers educators and that makes sense considering that they were leading revolutions and they bring a lot of marxist ideas with them there are some people who believe in marxism socialism communism too now there are some other immigrants there are a lot of british that are going to come over uh, scandinavians people from sweden norway finland denmark and you find a lot of scandinavians in northern illinois wisconsin and minnesota the place my family is from you can find a swedish hospital system swedish school system swedish cemeteries swedish food and by the way swedish food is really really good you'd be surprised uh, and then out west you find a lot of chinese uh, and the chinese are really building the railroads out west now there are a lot of tensions during this time uh, for example, you have Protestants versus Catholics. Uh, the Irish are overwhelmingly Catholic. There are a lot of German Catholics. And there was this real fear in the United States in the 1830s, 1840s, and even the 1850s that the United States would become a Catholic country. And the Protestant Americans were afraid that the United States would fall under influence of the Pope. And you might think that's kind of weird, but once upon a time, the Pope was much more powerful than he is today. Now he's basically a figurehead. And the Protestants start to get a little militant about it. Uh, there's even an anti-Catholic political party that is formed. It's called the Know Nothing Party. And the Know Nothing Party, they vow to never vote for a Catholic, never to vote for a foreign-born candidate. Uh, so, if the Know Nothing Party was around today, they never would have voted for Arnold Schwarzenegger to be uh, the governor of California. Now, before I go on to fear of Marxism, I'm going to give you the word of the day. The word of today is Easter. I hope everybody has a good and safe Easter this weekend. So, the word of the day is Easter. All right, number two on this list is a fear of Marxism. Once again, this is a world history thing. Uh, Karl Marx is going to be doing his work in the 1840s and 1850s over in Europe. And when the German people come to America, they bring their Marxist ideas with them. So workers start to want to be organized. They are pushing for better pay, better work hours, unions. All of that is an influence of Marxism in Germany. Uh, there becomes a real big fear of labor unions. Uh, labor unions were all about labor reform and they made politicians nervous so labor unions end up being kind of a bad thing for a couple of years here there's also a tension between education and non-education there's a tension between industry and agriculture all those british immigrations they kind of bring over industrialization and there's a competition between the old way of life and the new way of life. Even farms start to become mechanized. Uh, the cotton gin spreads, other farm materials spread, the John Deere plow, the Cyrus McCormick Reaper, all of that's going on. And then, of course, slavery includes, uh, increases because of the cotton demand. And the more cotton, the more slaves, the more slaves, the more cotton. And the more industrialization there is, means there are more machines that need to be made. The more machines that need to be made, the more factories are built, the more factories are built, the more industrialization there is. So there's this real big competition there. And then last but not least, you've got North versus South. Uh, this is the time period before uh, things get really, really bad. So you're gonna end up with uh, people complaining and arguing over slavery. Uh, the South is relying on more slaves, the North is beginning to be more vocal against slavery. 
Uh, you've got the immigration, of course. There's no quotas or anything like that. Anybody can come in, but native people, meaning people who've been here for a couple of generations, and brand new immigrants are going to start butting heads. Uh, there's competition and um, competition tension. I'm trying to think of how I want to word that. You know, with slaves and machines, uh, northern economy versus southern economy, northern factories versus southern factories. So there's tension that's going to be rising all over the place in the 1840s, and then it's going to get worse in the 1850s, as you will see next week. All right. So once again, uh, a quick reminder is that all of the summer classes will be online. There won't be any face-to-face -face classes this summer. Uh, go ahead and sign up for something if you need to. Uh, us faculty members, us professors, instructors will be teaching you online, much like we're doing right now. And that registration is going to begin on Monday. So look for that on Monday. As far as when fall registration is going to be, we don't know that yet. We are still waiting to hear what's going to happen. A lot of it's going to depend on social distancing and how we do. So um, once again, stay safe, have fun, have a good Easter. Uh, make sure that you check the, the course calendar for any due dates. If you have to work on the SLO, uh, make sure you're working on that. I will try and get the SLO rough drafts back to you this weekend if you've already turned them in. All right, until next time, we'll see you later.